people on it that probably won't happen. Because the, 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 the post stays, the video stays on the yeah. Facebook page. And that, that's kind of a good thing, too. Mm. Seems really dark in here. Mm. Oh. Huh. How's that? Right? Uh, from over here, the screen looks crooked, but here it looks straight. <laughs> Just, um, maybe I'm crooked. Hmm. So that's what we're going with. And according to the Arizona Commerce Authority, this is the next step in educating people while they're at home. So what about Carmen's cleaning? Who? Carmen's cleaning. Um, we had to keep it to five. Stacy came up with 10. Stacy Stacy Lambert was like, it's five, okay? And she had it that they had the baby on. How about team maintaining while we are all apart? How about team maintaining while we're apart? <laughs> okay, we can talk about that. Matt Molinar. <coughs> all right. Who's that? We have 14 live. Okay, cool. Uh, good morning. I welcome to um, team building. I usually do this in conjunction with our customer service because great customer service is given by great teams. It's hard to have a bad team give good customer service. But in the interest of time, and these are unique times, I kind of split these out and did customer service, I think, uh, two Mondays ago and decided to do team building all by itself. So what do you want to learn? Someone said, what was, what was the question they had? What did you learn? Team maintaining while we're apart. Yeah, team maintaining. Probably came from one of the chamber uh, staffers because we're, we're such social creatures. We, we do so many things together and we're rocking and rolling and everyone has their own skill set. So while they have their, their lanes that they stay in, we, in my opinion, are a very cohesive team and we feed off each other's energy. So this is a good one. Hopefully we'll talk about that. Maybe some of the lessons we'll learn will help you maintain that team spirit, if you will, while we're not together. But in all of these things, in a great team, it's about the individuals within the team. It's about you. It's about having the right energy, the right attitude, the right desire to be part of a great team and, and let the team flourish, okay? What else do we want to learn? Let's take a second, uh, be thinking about that. What do you want to learn? Maybe write it down where you are. We're gonna talk about some office personalities later, uh, which is gonna be kind of fun. Um, it only has 16. There's probably hundreds and hundreds of different office personalities. We're, we just capsulated down into 16, which could be some fun at the end, okay? Turn to the next slide, please. So, what do, you want, what do you want to accomplish? It's your 45 minutes. I say this with most of my presentations. We are on this rock for that much time. Money comes, money goes. Um, things come and things go but time is the most precious. So make this the best use of your time, this next 45 minutes where you learn, and <clears throat> promise yourself you'll put at least one thing into practice that you might learn today. You'll make a change or be more receptive or be more thoughtful or just make yourself a note. I will do one thing differently as a result of this next 45 minutes. And then write it down. If you write it down, it becomes real. If you write it down, it becomes real. So write it down, what would you want to learn in the next 45 minutes? Any other questions, Tanya, coming in? Okay, next slide, please. Ah, we have to first learn about ourselves. And sometimes the self-realization, the understanding of who we are, why we are, what we are, 
is really, really important. I think there's a, a, a self-acknowledgement, uh, understanding what we are and what we're not is really, really important. So what I like to do is I want to play the who we are. What you want to do while you're at home, <clears throat> if you've seen this on video later or whatever, kind of close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes. You're going to your first day of first grade. First day of first grade, whether your mom's driving you there or your dad, or you're on the bus or you're walking. First day of first grade, okay? Once you go there, the sights, the smells, the cars, the lawns or not, no lawns, whatever it might be. All right, so think about that. Really absorb that first day of first grade. I will submit that is who you are. You're established. That is your normal, okay? That, 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 that's your foundation. That is your normal. And as you look around your teams, look, think about their first day of first grade, where they were, what they were, how they were, um, family dynamics, uh, cultures, locations, geographies, all of those things, that's their normal. That's their normal. So we have to respect those normals and really celebrate those differences. And I, I talk about my normal versus my wife, Deb. She has one sister. I have 10 brothers and sisters. So her normal is just diabolically different than my normal from the family dynamics to the dinner table to <clears throat> making lunches, you know, shining uh, nine pairs of shoes for Sunday mass on a Saturday night or putting together bag lunches all across the kitchen counter for, you know, all of these, these people. That's my normal and how we ate and, mm -hmm. and drank and slept and did stuff. My normal. Deb's normal. On the farm, doing stuff and animals and all kinds of so her normal is far different than my normal. And we get to celebrate those and talk about it quite a bit. But think about that within your team. Whether it was Long Beach, California, and we had one Mexican American in our whole school, the Gomez family. I met my first black person in the ninth grade. So my normal, my background, my understanding how I'm hardwired is really different and I've had to acquire and learn and adapt and change over time. But all of us in a team setting are that way. Adapt, learn, change, grow. That's important and you got to respect each other's normal and celebrate those differences. I mean if we were all the same it'd be boring. Understand those differences and great teams really consist of lots of different people from different backgrounds that they, they gel together because they focus on one thing, the goal. We'll talk about the goal in a couple of slides later. Next slide, Tanya, please. I have a couple of quotes and I talk about teams and cooperation. The most powerful force ever known on this planet is human cooperation, a force for construction and destruction. Think about world leaders, okay? Adolf Hitler had people cooperating in a very destructive way. Then you have um, the Churchills and you've got you know, a variety of great leaders who got people to cooperate for construction. So think about that, this, the cooperation, that, that thing that says, I, I believe in it, I'm buying into it, I'm going to go for it, I, I'm going to really shoulder to shoulder and go forward with somebody. It's a powerful force, this, uh, this human cooperation. It does great things and it does bad things. But cooperation is, is not, you're not capitulating, but you're saying, yeah, this is a good thing. I'm all in, I'm all in. Human cooperation is powerful. Next slide, Tanya, please. Thank you. Eleanor Roosevelt, obedience may have its uses, but it is no substitute for willing, uncoerced cooperation. The true buy-in, I believe in the mission, I believe in what we're doing, I believe in the greater good, and I believe that our organization is, is that. And I'm not being obedient, 
I've chosen to do this. In a previous life, I would tell people, I chose this job, I chose this company, I chose this city, I chose this pay, I chose this job title, I chose these tasks. I, I, was, I, was, I took it upon myself to say I was doing this, it's on me to make it great. Can't blame anybody else. Uncoerced cooperation. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was one of the very few totally self-actualized individuals. Now Maslow had this theory of self-actualization, kind of a, of a ladder <clears throat> getting to the top rung of being totally self-actualized. Uh, Einstein, uh, Jesus Christ, and probably Mother Teresa, it's a very, very short list, but Albert Einstein was considered by Maslow as being totally self-actualized, all a human being could be. He is all a human being could be, yet even Einstein needed other people. Nothing truly valuable can be achieved except by the unselfish cooperation of many individuals. This guy, <clears throat> think about that, Albert Einstein himself, in this echelon of self-actualized as the upper echelon of all a human being could be, said, I need more humans. I have, I need, I need other people. Nothing can be truly valuable except for the unselfish cooperation. I think that's important when you think about who understands this cooperation thing, who understands this, we need other people. And that's what teams are all about. Teams are all about unselfish cooperation of many individuals. That's what great teams are all about. Next slide, Tony, please. So what drives you? And, I, and I, I like these triangles. You probably saw a triangle in the customer service uh, piece. You saw the triangle in the sales piece. When it comes to individuals, there's lots of drivers, things that make us do what we do, things that make us not do what we don't want to do. And there's lots of influences and things like that, but I'll submit that you distill it all down, boil it all down, there's really three main drivers. Faith, family, and fortune. You think about that. And it's hard to master all three of those. I mean, you're gonna take care of yourself, we hope. Uh, you're gonna take care of the organization or the team or the family uh, or you know, the fortune. This, is, this pays the bills, this, this is your clients, your customers. <clears throat> It, it, you have to think about who am I going to really take care of the most? Um, which mm -hmm. going to, most of us going to do too. It's a very rare breed, a rare breed of individual who can master all three. And you, you're going to be short sighted on one. And you'll always have to work on that and think through that. It, as a younger man at the Los Angeles Times, I was an extraordinarily successful account executive. Um, my family was very well taken care of. Um, the company loved me. I was making them a bunch of money. I was making a bunch of money. And I was really focused down here and I did lose sight of, of my faith. I lost sight of some substantive things that were really, really important. I had things, I had all kinds of accolades. I had this stuff going on down here, but for a period of time, I gave way to that. So again, finding that balance is really tough. Most of us go and nurture two of these at once and need help with the three. So think about the teams that you're with. There are, there are people who are, love their clients and doing great things, and maybe the organization or their family is suffering. Think about your teammates, think about the folks on your team and what drives them. And they may not tell you, and maybe you're not supposed to guess, but just know this. They struggle with the same things we all do because all of us are bound together. We're all bound together by this fact. Every single one of us loves something, has lost something, and is afraid of something. I don't care who you are. There's, all of us, really, all three of us, love something, afraid of something, and have lost something. Those things tie human beings together. Just like this, 
okay, these ties together, understand that about each other, and begin to be part of a great team. Next slide, please. So what drives you? Again, why do you, where you work, why do you like working there? Okay, uh, and I've seen the people who are drudgery. Oh man, it's Sunday night, I gotta go to work tomorrow, I hate that place. Leave, don't go, do yourself a favor. Put yourself out of your misery. Think about why you're at that place of work. Think about the great things that you're doing at that place of work. And think about the great things you're doing and the great people you're doing it with. Those are the ties that bind. You gotta ask yourself, why do you like working there? Why do you go to bed early on Sunday? Um, take care of yourself a bit better. You're excited for Monday morning. You're fired, you get fired for Monday morning, it's gonna be great. Well, so what drives you? Is it your faith, your family, or your fortune? Maybe you're lucky and you've, you've mastered all three at that place of work. If not, give it a second shot. You look and think, how can you do it better? What are you missing? What part of the team are you skating out on? Make it better. I know you can. What does being on a team mean to you? Again, there's lots of different definitions of being on a team and that all of us get to the destination at the same time. That means I may have to help someone else a little bit. Um, someone may need to give me a hand. I may have to come in a little extra early to help the team. I, I may have to take on a new project or do something I'm not comfortable with. Those that know me know I hate the budgets. I hate the financial stuff. It's icky. <laughs> it is. But... I've had to adapt, so I, I get in extra early, I study it better, I work on it more, because it's my weak spot, my blind spot, if you will. We all have that. But being on a team means I want to do well for others. I want, to, I want them to succeed. Other than the pay, why do you do what you do? Other than the pay, is it, there has to be something fulfilling about what you're doing. There has to be something that says, I feel great today, here's what I contributed today. Here's what my team did today. Other than the pay, think, okay, uh, think about this. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do with that team other than the pay? How important is it to the greater good? How, are you serving others? Are you taking care of others? Does what you do uh, mean something other than the pay? Great teams understand the big picture. Great teams, great teams know that we all have our own weight to pull. Other teams, great teams, know everyone has a role to play. And other than the pay, they know that they're making a difference. Great teams do that. Tony, next slide, please. The organization has a responsibility to creating great teams. And sometimes they haven't uh, hired for fit. They have all of the same personality types, all hard chargers, um, all of them are disciplinarians, uh, all of them are the executive types, the entrepreneur types. They're all entrepreneurs. If they're entrepreneurs, nothing gets done, seriously. So again, the organization has responsibility to hire correctly, of course, for fit and for culture, but the organization has to have one common shared goal and they communicate the goal repeatedly. I do this, when I do this uh, team building session with chamber members, I've done this for as few as eight people, as many as 35. But again, I make them finish this next sentence. Next slide, Tanya, please. Critter, my company is this. This is your elevator speech. So if you're, um, when we get through this thing and you're at a conference someplace, you're in the, the elevator and you've got a logo or a name badge, huh, Chamber of Commerce, what's that? Well, my company is this. It's very important. We talk about our slogan of connecting partners and fostering opportunity. We talk about putting people together for the greater good. We talk about taking all of our assets, putting them together to get something accomplished. So the the business and the team has to finish this sentence. The elevator, it's important because if you got that logo on and it says Chamber of Commerce, what do you work? Chamber of Commerce. 
And you're proud of that where you go, I work at the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, you're proud and you're busting out over with pride because you understand the team element. It's important that you have this elevator speech. So think about that. Whoever's out there watching, if you're doing it later, my company is what? And make sure the team understands that common goal. The team knows why you do what you do. The team knows that when we're successful, this happens. And when this happens, this happens. That there's a domino effect of the great work that you do. There's a domino effect of being on a great team, working together, that other great things happen as a result of that because you understand the elevator speech. You understand the mission or the vision or the elevator speech about what your company is. It's important. Next slide, please, honey. Thank you. So when you're on a great team, you celebrate small victories. And those are really, really important. Small victories can be something as that one customer came in and you made that one customer happy. Or this project that just doesn't seem to get done, gets done. Um, or the project nobody wanted. There's always those. No, we, we, no, no, we don't want that one. Someone takes it and gets done. It's completed and correct and successful. Everyone celebrates in those small victories. The small ones are important. They add up. So when you celebrate small victories, everybody gets to share the glory. When it goes south, a great team, everyone takes the blame. Everyone huddles together with an after-action report and says, okay, here's where we failed. It's not where here's where you failed, where you failed. Here's where we failed, or here's where we fell short. Here's where we disappointed ourselves. Here's where we didn't do our best. Always focusing on the we, and then you fix it. Everyone is a, is a success. And again, when we say we, we did this, we accomplished this, we missed this mark, we need to do something different and better. The organization flourishes. I mean, you can't help but be part of a successful organization because the successful team took responsibility. The successful team really analyzes what went right and what went wrong. Our successful team will look and say, here's what happened we were great at this, and we could have done better at this. Back to the sales training, remember, what did you learn? What did you do well? What might you do differently next time? The same thing after action report, after an event, um, after a meeting, after a, a new product rollout. All those things. What did you learn? What did you do, what did you do well? And what might you do differently next time? Analyze that. This is going to happen. You do this well, the organization is going to flourish. Next slide, Tony, please. Thank you. Boy, I really hate to use sports analogies. I really do. But I had the pleasure of listening to uh, Luis Gonzalez. I was uh, addressing uh, the state legislature. And he's not the greatest motivation speaker in the world. He just isn't. But he told a great story about the 2001 World Series champion, Arizona Diamondbacks. He said, most of us didn't really like each other very much. He goes, we were dysfunctional. Um, we were all over the board personality-wise. Some of us just, quite frankly, did not like each other. But when they got on the field, and they crossed the foul lines and got into the field to play. It was all about the unity of the team, all about executing the fundamentals. It was all about building each other up on the field. It was all about making each other better on the field, all about taking responsibility on the field, all about sacrificing themselves in some cases for the greater good, for the team. They were a bunch of misfits, and he says that. But Great champions have respect, understanding, and professionalism. Think about that with your team. Think about those misfits. <laughs> I occasionally am a misfit. We all have those misfit moments. And sometimes we don't really like each other, especially in big organizations and complex organizations. Phone call. Thank you, Tony, for <laughs> shutting that off. Live events do that. It's, it's live. 
But those organizations who are successful really put themselves second in the organization, or in this case, in Luis Gonzalez's case, the team first. They had a bunch of great individual stars on that team. They had a couple of Hall of Famers on that team. Um, a cup, I think a couple of future Hall of Famers as well. But he said they didn't like each other. They really didn't. I thought that was a telling story about a world champion, world series champion team who still gives me goosebumps every time I watch game seven, but he talks about the team, the team goals, the accomplishments far exceeded the fact that they didn't like each other a whole lot because they had respect, understanding, and professionalism. The team came first, ultimately building a great team. Next slide. Now, I usually show a video during my team building, but I can't show a video. So I thought, what would be fun is looking at different office personalities. And again, this comes from Tiffany Rivers, a smart, smart workplace. And you're going to notice some of the types of personalities that you deal with. And as you're sheltering in place, and as you're sitting there at home or at your office watching on Facebook Live, think about which personality you might be or the several personalities you might be. I, I could be, I think, all 16 of these. I must be some kind of weird chameleon, some wackadoodle that, that just has this multi-personality thing going on. But there's 16 of them. And think about this. Think about how you get to hone your skills, how you get to alter maybe your frame of reference as it relates to your teammates. So team maintaining while we're apart, think about the person you don't care for. But you need to respect them. Think about the person that you say, um, I hope I don't get invited to their wedding because I'm not going to go. Okay, don't go. But respect the fact that they're on your team and they have a, they have a mission to accomplish just like you do. That's really, really important. You're on the same team to accomplish the same goal. This, the business will not flourish unless the team really comes together and hits the finish line at the same time. The architect, heads down, hard worker, independent, private. That's good. On the downside, seemingly arrogant and judgmental. All right. So the organization of the team, give them a task and leave them alone. The, this, this is... These are smart people. They're just not gonna be game show hosts, and that's okay. <laughs> Their style is to just work hard, be independent, get things done. They have a great sense of accomplishment. They don't need to hang around uh, the coffee pot and chit chat all day, that's not their style. And management's gonna give them a task and leave them alone because they know that they're driven to success that way. The rest of us think that they're arrogant. They're not. That's just how they are. They, they're, they're not arrogant. They seem that way only because they're the things that drive them. But when the logist, logistician, I had to do that one 10 times over, the logistician, inventive, creative, intelligent, loyal. And we, these are great people. They're loyal, intelligent, creative, inventive. But the rest of, of us might see them as insensitive and, and eccentric. They, they're... There are eccentricities that we all have. We take these off ramps to our personalities. This person, people think that they're insensitive. They're not. They're just not driven the way you are. Imagine if everyone was like you. It would be a boring place. And here's what, when we talk about these 16 personalities and we talk about people with success, it's not what happens to us. It's how we deal with what happens to us. So it's not those that are thrown around us in our team setting. We can't control that. What we control is how we handle that. What we control is our own mindset on how we deal with these individual personalities. You, you can't control your team and who's on it. You can't, unless you're the boss. And then you're in a different session altogether. But if you, you can't control that, so you can control how you understand these teammates their DNA, their normal, their cultures, their backgrounds, and their inner workings of their personalities. So again, with the, with the logistician, 
give them guidance, and then leave them alone. They need a little guidance, but let, let them do their work. They're going to be great. Let them do their thing. Next, next slide. The commander, ha, born leader, strong will, firm. And again, this is good. However, they can be stubborn, impatient, ruthless. Okay, because that's what drives them. And they may be seen this way or they may really be this way. But again, understanding that their leaders are strong, they're firm, they love the rules. Give them recommendations with confidence. Now, this is important. The commanders can be they might have that personality where they're standoffish and almost like truth to power. You don't want to you don't want to Hang with the commander. So you want to give them recommendations with confidence and back it up with facts and figures. You got to hang with the commanders. You have to hang with these people because again, they're on your team. Don't wilt away, do your homework, be prepared for that conversation with the commander. They're gonna be on your team. But you can't come at them half-baked. If you're gonna have a conversation with the commander, have the goods, be succinct, give recommendations, but be confident with that recommendation. The debater, he's energetic, quick thinker. Sometimes the debater will just argue for the fun of it because that's what they like to do because they're usually, they're usually right too. I love them to be consultants, give them flexible hours because again, they're, they quick think, they're in and out, they're in and out of processes. They think about this, get it done, get them in, get them out, get them gone, get them in, get them out, get them gone. And they'll listen to all these conversations all over the office and they'll jump in and they'll give their, their quick wit, their two cents and a boogie. Every office has one, but let them be, give them flexible hours, let them be consultants, let them be the expert every now and again. It's okay, but they're best at being, having flexible hours, they're best at not being in a box. They're best at having whatever hours make them feel important. And look at the work done, they're great workers, but, but they're different. They're different than you, they're different than me. The great teams have these different individuals. Next slide please, Tanya. Thank you. The advocate. Reserved, decisive, extremely loyal. However, with all that, <laughs> they're restless and frustrated because not everyone thinks like me. Why, do, why does anyone think like me? You know, what, what, what's, what's going on here? So they're confused. Let Give them the big picture. They really want to know the long-term effect. They want the 35,000 foot level. Oh, okay, I get it now. The minutia they don't like. They also like their privacy. They don't like the minutia, but again, they also want to be private. The mediator, imaginative, intuitive, idealistic. However, their, inter their introvert ways give them time to themselves. They would think stuff, they have a kind of a low self-esteem. Give them big long-term projects. Give them important long-term projects. Their value is the fact that you've given them important work to do. Their value is they're going to be tasked with this for a long time. Their value is the fact that they're intuitive and imaginative. They're great parts of your team, and they're, they're different. They're not going to make game show hosts. That's not what you want. You want someone who has this skill set, and they'll do great with long-term projects. Tanya, next slide, please. The campaigner. <laughs> Curious, energetic, enthusiastic, friendly. Again, always campaigning for something, always doing great stuff. However, this person can't focus or do detailed oriented tasks since they're too busy having fun, too busy doing great things, too busy having uh, in everyone's face, basically, in everyone's business. Let them explore the new stuff. Give them new technology. Give them new ideas. Give them new projects. Let them brainstorm. Let them think outside the box. It's okay. That's what they do. That's what they do. But don't give them the financials to do. That would be a bad thing. They can't focus on that. Details, the minutiae, again, this, this person, that's not their deal. They love, love, love um, brainstorming and the new stuff. The, the protagonist, charismatic, inspiring, warm, friendly. Again, another person who's not really great at it, not really good at finances. However, this person is a student of the human being. Really likes people, okay? Hum HR projects, give them projects to do like um, 
payroll studies, benefit studies. Um, uh, you, you give them um, work to do as far as people and personalities and, and projects involving a dynamic of new individuals. This is a great person to have on your team as long as you don't let them do their financials. That would be a bad thing. Okay? Next time, please. The logistician. Order, deadlines, hard work. This is, this is a machine. This is a machine. Knows the rules. In at 8, out at 5, uh, lunch at 12.10, you know, back at 12.50. Knows all the policies and procedures. Again, it's a machine. And they're thought of as a hard charger or a hard ass. The thing, though, is with this individual, they have impeccable personal integrity. They're proud of the fact that they really know the rules and, and, and regulations. So give them those tasks that require following intricate rules and regulations. Some of the new stuff coming down from Congress and the SBA, froth with rules and regulations. Give those tasks of distilling that down to, to this person. They love this stuff. It drives me crazy, but the, the logistician loves this stuff. That's the job to give them. The defender, loyal, supportive, practical. This person will defend you to, to, the, to the ends of the earth. This is a person that, that will shoulder to shoulder. We're going to get them. We, we got this. However, they don't change very well, and they spend too much time focusing on others' opinions about themselves. Because they're so busy defending you, they sometimes can't defend themselves. They're so busy helping you out, they can't help themselves. Not good traits. However, the boss or the teammate says, here's how we can help you. Always be looking for this individual who wants to do well for the team, might need a little extra hand-holding, might need a little extra push, and say, here's how I can help with this project and get them focused off defending everybody else and working on their tasks along with you. Next slide, please, Tanya. Thank you. The executive. We know the executive. Law and order, honesty, hard work. I mean, this person, you know, square jaw, you know, furrowed brows. This is the executive. However, the, the, the uh, executive is a big rat fink. Will love to tell on other people, uh, point out your flaws, you know, you told me you'd have that project in at 4 o'clock, and it took you to 4.15. You got, you got the project. You're not leaving until 6 o'clock anyway. But again, the executive, you said 4 o'clock. You said 4 o'clock. You said 4 o'clock. That's, that's where they live, in a very finite world. They live in this nice box. And it's good for them. And that works for them may not work for everybody else, but it works for them. Whenever you can, to work with the law, the executive, you have to show them that you have pulled the rules too. And if you know you disappointed the executive, and they may not be the boss, just the executive type, work harder. If you promise four o'clock with the report, do four o'clock. It's really, really important. To get along with the executive, okay, the law and order types, you have to abide by the rules too. You, you, you do. Or this is gonna be a problem. Do your best to work with the executive and be a lot of order person too. The council loves to help and spread cheer. This is a cheerleader. This is, this is your raw, raw person. However, they don't like rejection and they come off seemingly as needy. You know, aren't you happy about this too? No, we have coffee every morning at 30. But coffee's great, isn't it? It's just coffee. So again, this person needs lots of propping up because they're enthusiastic about everything. Again, you know, let them know, yeah, we love coffee, we'll have coffee again tomorrow, acknowledge that and move on. But again, they love to be cheerleading about insignificant things. Let them run with it, it's okay. Next one, please. The virtuoso, yes, rational, calm, spontaneous. Risk taker, blunt, almost has an escape sense of humor. There's something about the virtuoso that is kind of a conundrum, okay? But in order to keep the virtuoso on task and on the team and a participating member of the team, give them, have them tackle immediate hands up. Keep them busy. You gotta keep them busy. You really, you keep this person with a sense of accomplishment and a sense of importance, but again, make sure the virtuoso uh, is not spontaneous because this is also a negative, uh, could be a negative on your team. 
and this person is always flying off the handle and going in separate off ramps and things like that. The adventurer lives in the moment. This is a charming guy or woman. They're, they're just awesome to be around. They're terrific. Very friendly, knowledgeable, smart, but really, they're pretty unpredictable and they're not real good at planning. Don't, don't, have the, don't put them on the team. If you have a timeline to create for something, a rollout, um, a, a second business that you're going to be having or, or some new product, don't put them on that, that, that committee. That's not good. However, give them important immediate tasks. Keep their minds occupied. Keep them busy on stuff at hand. Because their unpredictability could be a problem. But, again, the fact that they're not good at planning, then don't have them do it. But this is, this is a fun person in the office. Everybody loves them. They can be dangerous, but again, everybody loves them. The adventurer. Next slide, please, Sonia. Last two. I, I, I will submit there's probably hundreds and hundreds of personalities, but I like these 16. I, I looked at many, 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 many opinions on the office personalities, but these 16 struck a chord with me. And we, we didn't talk about you know the, the ne'er-do-wells, the always lazy, always calling out, because again, those folks will self-select out. We don't want to spend time with those folks. We want to spend time with people that are really going to be on our team moving forward. Entertainer, social butterfly, everybody loves the entertainer. Give him a microphone, he's the center of attention, he loves it, and he's got everyone's attention. However, entertainer is easily bored and will lose focus. And this is a little scary, because they want the excitement, they want the, the fun, the new, um, they want to be on the leading edge of things. Sometimes they want to be in the spotlight. So. You have to appeal to their sense of fun and creativity. Give them those new projects. We're thinking about adding this. What do you think? Go, go see what it looks like later and come back. They, they like that because, again, it allows them to be the entertainer for just a little bit. And the entrepreneur. The entrepreneurs are scary because they're pluses, innovators, rule breakers. They think outside the box. Matter of fact, they've thrown the box away. There is no box. There is no box. However, well, being a rule breaker can be a good thing for the entrepreneur, it can also be a bad thing. And the entrepreneur sometimes goes one, two, ten. I think I invented that concept, going one, two, ten. And sometimes <clears throat> they don't consider the consequences of their actions. So the entrepreneur, let them go for it. Give them new ideas, give them new technology, give them new things to do. Let the entrepreneur play the entrepreneur within the rules, within the boundaries of what makes sense for the organization so that the team finishes together to the finish line, okay? I'm gonna go back to this. Team maintaining while we're apart. There's lots of technology today with, with Zoom and FaceTime and going to meeting and those sorts of things and that's fine. I think the random text, the random messenger, you know, how you doing? I'm into my third cheeseburger of the day. How about you? Um, I, I just saw your email. Can I give you a call and talk about that? There's tons of ways of staying together, tons of ways of maintaining the team, but I'll submit. You might fall prey because you're not together, worried about each other's feelings. You're going to nitpick. You know... Fred, I haven't heard from Fred in three days. He probably left town. He's on the payroll, so he's working for work. I bet you Fred went to the beach. Don't go down that rabbit hole. Don't worry about folks that you think are pulling their fair share. Not your business, not your place. Participate with what you can participate with. Do what you can do. Don't worry about Fred. Again, if someone's going down that rabbit hole, they're going to self-select out. Focus on what you can do while you're apart. Focus on the great things you can talk about while you're apart. Thinking about, for me, thinking about the back side of this. What will your organization look like in June? What great things we have accomplished now and prepared for now that in July you'll be able to do X, Y, Z. You gotta think about the back side of this thing and how prepared are you to come out of this 
stronger, faster, quicker, better, smarter, leaner, whatever. But you have to be thinking in those terms. For me, it's called hope. An old boss of mine said, hope is a great thing to have. It's just not a great business strategy. Hope is a good thing to have, especially right now, but be thinking about your, your, your teammates and include everybody, even Fred, okay? Include all of those people. Maintain the team and do what you can do. There's lots of ways to do it in your time and at your place of business. Any other questions, Tanya? Can you give some ideas on how to celebrate high fives around the office or what are some better ideas to make everyone feel appreciated? Ah, you, you can't say thank you enough. You just can't say thank you enough because again, back to my Phil Collins story last week about one performer on stage and it was being celebrated three different ways. There were the dancing the aisles, there was the people that were letting the music just take over them. I mean, it was really something awesome. And then there were those that were stoned and passed out. So again, we're all, we're all having the same COVID-19 shelter in place. How we deal with that is uniquely different. There's fear out there. There's real fear, okay? Understand that and, and really let folks know it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be worried. It's okay, these are all human emotions. However, fear is worry of the unknown. To me, that's a little irrational. Worry of the unknown. Worrying about what you don't know. Okay, so let's set fear aside and put it in, in its place. People can be appreciated by saying thank you. Thank you for hanging in. Thank you for being there when I called. Thank you for being receptive to my idea. Even though we didn't utilize it, thank you for listening. Um, thank you for understanding the fact that I'm out of sorts. I throw right-handed, I write right-handed, I play golf right-handed. I, In this whole shelter in place, I feel left-handed. I really feel I'm missing, I miss my team, I, I miss the phone calls, I miss the calls to the office, you know, which RV park has the best bocce ball court? The kinds of calls we get at the gym that are fun and different. Again, I miss those things. I also miss helping small businesses be successful in a real intimate, personal way. But I can't let my fear permeate my team. So say thank you as often as you possibly can for hanging with you. Say thank you for hanging with the organization. Understanding we all have the same fears, but again, you're going to appreciate people differently. Um, I would have plenty of chocolate in the office and sometimes on occasion by lunch. I can't do that right now. So as often as I can, I tell my team, thank you, I appreciate you, you guys rock, things like that. A little of that right now is like rocket fuel. Do it appropriately, do it genuinely, but make a conscious effort to celebrate each other, okay? It's really important right now. Anything else, honey? Yep, that's it. Okay, what, what, what's our timing? It is 11 18. 11 18. Okay, great. I hope you had fun with this. Again, tell folks to go to the Facebook, Chamber's Facebook page. Uh, it'll reside there for a while. And again, uh, and maybe next week on Monday, we'll do customer service at maybe 3 in the afternoon. So that way, those folks who couldn't do the morning session, maybe we'll do these next three sessions in the afternoon to catch those folks that couldn't catch it earlier. Again, stay healthy, stay together. Stay positive, and please shop locally. We appreciate you. Thanks for being part of the Chamber. Bye for now.